Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we all tonight? Good. My name is Mark Razzi. I'm from the Public Services Office here at the lab. Just wanted to thank you all for coming tonight. All of you on the net, thank you for joining us as well. Jupiter's moon Europa may be a habitable world. There's evidence that suggests there may be a global subsurface ocean beneath the moon's icy shell. And the lack of large craters suggests a surface age of only 60 million years, implying that Europa is still geologically active. Tidal flexing of the floating ice shell generates stresses that can fracture and deform the surface to create Europa's intriguing troughs, ridges, and bands. And it is this unique moon's astonishing geology and astrobiology potential, astrobiological potential, that make it a top priority for space exploration. Tonight's speaker received his BA in Geological Sciences from Cornell University in 1986, then went on to obtain his PhD in Geology from Arizona State University in 1994. From 1995 through 2001, he studied at Brown University as a postdoctoral research associate in geological sciences. Then, he, there rather, he became an affiliate member of the Galileo imaging team and worked to plan many of the spacecraft's observations of Jupiter's icy Galilean satellites. Then, in 2001, he went on to work as an assistant professor of planetary sciences at the University of Colorado at Boulder until 2006. Today, he's a principal scientist and director's fellow in the Planetary ICES group within the sciences division of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, California. His research focuses on the processes that have shaped the icy satellites of the outer solar system, in particular Europa, and the role of its probable subsurface ocean. Such research includes the possibility that convection has played an important role in the satellite's history, investigation of regions of separation and spreading of the satellite's icy lithosphere, and the existence of a liquid water ocean beneath the icy surface. And while busy with all this, he continues to publish scientific research papers, serve on a variety of teams and committees, mentor graduate student researchers, and work with various museums and organizations to bring the excitement of astronomy and planetary exploration to the public. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Robert Pappalardo. Thank you, Mark. You've heard it all. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for, for coming. It's a great crowd tonight. Uh, I have the pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, this fellow here, Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, and arguably one of the most fascinating bodies in our solar system. Um, not only because we don't really understand what's going on to make this cracked eggshell-like appearance on this moon, but because we think we understand that beneath the icy shell of Europa lies a global subsurface ocean, more water than the volume of all of Earth's oceans combined. So what I'd like to do this evening is bring you on a tour of Europa through the various kinds of geological features we see on the surface and what we think they tell us about what's going on beneath the ice. Uh, so our story has a couple of heroes I'll bring you back to 1610 and the first pictures, if you like to call them that, of uh, Europa and the other moons of Jupiter. It's in 1610 that Galileo first pointed his spyglass toward the heavens and realized there was something strange going on around Jupiter. On January 7, 1610, he made this sketch of Jupiter and these little stars as he thought they were. And then on the next night, they looked like this. And on the next night, it was cloudy in Padua. And <laughs> then on subsequent nights, he realized these little things he thought were stars were going around Jupiter. They were somehow related to Jupiter. Now we know their moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And we can go to the solar system simulator page at JPL and punch in those dates and the view from Padua, Italy at about 7.30 in the evening and understand what he was seeing, exactly which of the moons he was seeing, which nights have labeled which of the moons here. And the first night, actually, Io and Europa were right on top of one another. He thought it was one. He thought, saw Io, Europa, and Ganymede on that second night and missed out on Callisto. So why was this so important? Because about 50 years earlier, Copernicus, in his book, uh, essentially published on his deathbed, 
said, oh, hypothetically, perhaps the sun might be the center of the universe rather than the Earth. Perhaps the planets were going around it, and perhaps our moon was going around the Earth, and the rest of the planets going around the sun. And so there were multiple centers of motion in this idea. Rather than the Earth being only the only center of motion and everything going around the, the Earth, he hypothesized that there were multiple centers of motion. And what Galileo's observations did is prove that Jupiter was a center of motion. So if Jupiter was a center of motion, maybe Earth was and the Sun was. And so indeed, maybe the planets were going around the Sun and our Moon going around the Earth. Now, one of the other heroes of our story is also Galileo, but this Galileo, and, and the one where you can see the model in the next room and right after the talk, if you didn't see it beforehand, see the life-size model of Galileo in the next room and its tape recorder and its broken antenna. Um, and, and it, from 95 to 2003, orbited around Jupiter. And with each orbit, it would make a close flyby of one of the large satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Now, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And Galileo, uh, the spacecraft, saw active volcanoes and active volcanism. That volcanism had been discovered by Voyager, of course, some years before that. But Voyager was just a flyby, flew through the system. There were two of them, one after the other, and got snapshots with Galileo with orbiting around Jupiter was able to revisit these moons time and time again. So Io is a rocky world, volcanically active. Ganymede and Callisto are kind of part rocky and part icy, about half and half. Ganymede has parts of its surface that have been torn apart by tectonics. Callisto is kind of a boring, dead, cratered ice ball. Europa is actually mostly a rocky object. We know that from its density. We know its mass uh, uh, from its orbit. We know its size, so we know its volume, so we know its density. So we know its density is kind of like the density of rock. So, but from telescopes, we know that its surface is icy. We can look at the spectral fingerprint of reflected light off of it, so we know it has an icy surface. So what's going on is it probably has a skin of H2O above a rocky interior. So it's an odd moon. Here's what the surface looks like closer up. It looks different from, say, our moon or, say, Callisto, because it isn't covered with craters. There are very few craters. Here's one. Its name is Pwyll or Puch, if you're Welsh. Here's another impact structure of some kind, but there are really very few. In fact, from the number of big craters uh, on the surface, only a dozen or 20 or so, um, we can estimate how old that surface is, how long it's been since that surface was repaved. And that's only about 50 million years. It sounds like a long time, but on geological time scale, that's the blink of an eye. It's 1% of solar system history. What's gone on for the other 99% at Europa, we're not sure. So strange place, young surface, crisscrossed by these ridges and bands. Um, then it has this other modeled looking terrain. So what the heck's going on there? Well, again, from the density of Europa, we know something about what's going on inside. And better than that, from gravity, from the Galileo spacecraft going by Europa, making close passes by Europa, we have an idea not just of its density, but the distribution of mass inside. Essentially, by feeling out the gravitational field as the spacecraft goes by a planet or satellite. We can get an idea of how centrally concentrated the mass inside is. So we know Europa probably has an iron core down there in the center, and then its rocky mantle, and then again this skin of H2O, about 100 kilometers worth, plus or minus. 